talk about the biblical basis of baptism and church membership. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to take them and look with me and we'll start. We're going to have a look at different verses, but we're starting in Matthew chapter 28, uh, verses uh, 18 through 20. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. This is a passage that we often refer to as the Great Commission. The Great Commission, these are some of the last words of our Lord Jesus Christ before he ascended back up into heaven. And uh, this is what he tells us, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Matthew writes that Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That's a lot of authority, isn't it? Yeah. All of it. He has it. And so in that authority that he has, look, look at what he tells his disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So as we look at this subject of baptism and church membership, um, as I have developed my understanding and theology in the area of what we call ecclesiology or the doctrine of the church. Uh, I am indebted to Dr. Mark Dever and Nine Marks Ministries because they have produced a lot of really helpful resources that have helped me understand what the Bible teaches about baptism and church membership. And so much of what I'm gonna share with you today comes from their book, Committing to One Another, Church Membership. Now, our own church, we have a confession of faith that we call the Baptist Faith and Message. Our confession of faith at this point is the Baptist Faith and Message of 1963. And this is what it says about the church. Our confession says that a New Testament church of the Lord Jesus Christ is a local body of baptized believers who are associated by covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing the two ordinances of Christ, committed to his teachings, exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word, and seeking to extend the gospel to the ends of the earth. The church is an autonomous body operating through democratic processes under the lordship of Jesus Christ. In such a congregation, members are equally responsible. Its scriptural officers are pastors and deacons. The New Testament speaks also of the church as the body of Christ, which includes all of the redeemed of all the ages. That's what our church's confession of faith says about the church. And in that confession of faith is the implication that to be a member of a local church, to be a member of this church, means to be, first of all, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've gotta be saved, you gotta be born again. Uh, that's what the church is, supposed to be uh, the, a body of baptized believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we believe in what we call a regenerate church membership, that is the Holy Spirit is regenerated he's brought about new life in us so that we have believed on the lord jesus christ we've been saved and because we've been saved we are to become a part of a local church so this belief in the lord jesus christ is followed by baptism in fact, that's what we read here just a minute ago in Matthew 28. Jesus said, you know, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore in that authority and do what? Make disciples. In other words, share the gospel. Tell people how they can have their sins forgiven, how they can come to have eternal life. 
share the gospel with them. And once they become, once they're converted, once they say yes to Jesus, then he says, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we see an order to this. Belief and then baptism. And then what happens after that is usually they decide to associate together, to covenant together with a group, a local group of believers. That's what our confession of faith says. A New Testament church of the Lord Jesus Christ is a local body of baptized believers who are associated by covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel. So we see there in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, the order that things should occur in. Belief and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, followed by baptism, and as one's public profession of faith really would be their baptism before witnesses. And then uh, membership is granted into that local body of believers. You can also see this in Acts chapter two. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter two and look with me in verses 40 and 41. We see a similar uh, teaching here, a similar example in Acts chapter two, verses 40 and 41, where Peter has just finished a sermon about what is happening. This is the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is working. People are being saved. People are hearing the gospel. People are asking, what must we do? And in verse 40 and 41, we're told here in Acts 2, 40 and 41, with many other words, he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word, in other words, those who were saved, they received that message, were baptized and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. This was the beginning of the first church, the early church we call it. The, uh, as a good Baptist, I would call it the first Baptist church in Jerusalem. So there we go, we're off and running. So these actions of belief and baptism and covenant together in membership are steps that we Baptists believe are the natural order and teaching of scripture regarding life in a New Testament church. Other things that, are be, uh, that should be part of church life for its members are observing the ordinances of the church. The two ordinances that we think the Bible is very clear about is the ordinance of baptism so that when someone does come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we baptize them, whether it's here in this baptistry behind me or in a river, creek, lake, somewhere, where it's deep enough to put them under, you know? Uh, so we, we do the ordinances of baptism, ordinance of the Lord's Supper, um, obeying the teachings of Christ, exercising one's gifts, rights, and privileges as taught by the scriptures, and seeking to extend the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's what we believe about the church. Baptists have always held that church membership is biblical, that every Christian should be a member of a local church. And that's, and, and also that church membership makes a profound difference for good in a Christian's life. It's important to be a member of a church. So today I'm gonna share about our need for church membership. We need each other. We need one another. We need the fellowship of one another because sin is deceitful and we need to be accountable to one another. We're also gonna look at the mandate for membership. After all, if church membership is not biblical, then it's simply optional. But I think that after we look at this together in the word of God, that we're gonna see that Jesus expects every Christian to be a committed member of a local church. Now, if you're looking in the Bible for membership 
like we think about it today where John and Sally move to Rome and they visit this church one week and another church the next week and a different church the next and after a few weeks finally they decide to join the First Baptist Church of Rome you're not going to find that in the Bible not that directly um, and the reason you won't find that in the New Testament is because no one went church shopping because there was only one church in the community if it had one at all. But it's interesting, as you read through your New Testament in different places, you see things that imply that there were memberships, that there were lists. In fact, uh, you might want to jot down 1 Timothy chapter 5 because it's in 1 Timothy chapter 5 where the church kept lists of people such as the list of widows that were supported by the church. The church knew who were widows and who needed to be looked after more closely. And they kept lists so they knew who were widows in their churches. 1 Timothy 5. Also, a number of passages in the New Testament suggest that churches had some way of knowing who members were and who were not. And maybe you would recall the story of a man in the Corinthian church who was leading an immoral life. And Paul describes his lifestyle as one that does not occur even among the pagans. That's how bad this guy was. So you might want to jot down 1 Corinthians chapter 5 because that chapter talks about how the church was supposed to handle this sinner in their midst, this man who claimed to be saved but was not living like it at all. Paul wrote the Corinthians and told them to exclude this man from their assembly. Now think about what that means. You cannot exclude someone who's not been formally included in the first place. So they knew who was a part of their church and who was not. And then when you get to 2 Corinthians, Paul refers, he seems to refer to this same man by referring to the punishment inflicted on him by the majority. That's 2 Corinthians 2, 6 the punishment inflicted on him by the majority. Interesting words. And again, it's interesting because you can only have a majority if there is a defined group of people. In this case, a defined church membership. There was a vote taken to dismiss the man from the fellowship because of the way he was living. And there was a vote taken to restore him because it seemed that he had repented and they work in a redemptive way to restore him. So Paul cared about who was in and who was out. He cared because the Lord Jesus himself had granted churches the authority to draw a line as best they humanly could around themselves to mark themselves off from the world. In fact, go to Matthew 18 with me in your Bibles. If you'll turn there, we're going to look at a passage here regarding a brother who sins against you. Matthew 18, we'll start in verse 15. Matthew 18, we'll start in verse 15. This, this is a process that Jesus outlines with steps to take to resolve the issue of a sinning brother or sister in the church that hopefully would result in reconciliation among them and the membership. So Matthew 18, verse 15 through 70. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Okay, that's the first step. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. Amen. But if he, if he will not hear, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So that's step number two, if necessary. You escalate just a little bit more from that. And if he refuses to hear them, then tell it to the church. 
So that's the third step. And then if he refuses to even hear the church, you know, correctively, redemptively, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. So that's the final step. That he won't repent and straighten up and get right, then the church has the right to say, you're not a part of us anymore. In such a case, if need be, the church would decide whether someone was in or out. So we see these examples. We see the example in Acts where the members were told to select from among you seven men of good report. And some of the first deacons were chosen by the members of the church. And so that's another example. Healthy churches are congregations that increasingly reflect the character of God. Therefore, we want our earthly records in the church to reflect as much as possible heaven's own records. Those names recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, we're not going to be perfect about it because we're not God and we don't know everybody's heart. But we're going to work and be as careful as possible to that end. A healthy church aspires to receive and to dismiss individuals professing faith just as the New Testament instructs. That is that we're going to aspire to have a biblical understanding of membership. And it, it all starts with salvation. We already talked about that. Church membership begins when Christ saves us and makes us a member of his universal body, the church. In other words, we have this church, we're a local body right here called Emmanuel Baptist Church, but the Lord has his church universal, which is all the believers of all time, all over the world. And if you've been saved, you're a part of that. It automatically happens. And the membership in that universal body of Christ in the one big church, capital C, must work itself out. It must express itself in an actual local church. That's the normal, reasonable practice that you see in the New Testament. So church membership begins when we commit to a particular body. So being a Christian in the New Testament means being joined to a church. It means being a part of a church. And that has been the practice of Christians since the early days of the church. In fact, I'll have you turn to another passage of scripture, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. We can see what the writer here tells us about holding fast our confession. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Look, let's look at these verses. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Amen to that. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So Hebrews, these verses here, says we're instructed to assemble regularly so that we can regularly rejoice in our common hope in our common faith and spur one another onto love and good deeds. That's one reason we're here today, to encourage one another. So it starts with salvation. It also involves responsibility. So when we identify ourselves with a local church, we're telling the church's pastors and other members, not just that we commit to them, but that we commit to them in gathering together, in giving, in prayer, and service. We're telling the church that 
as I join this church, you can expect certain things from me as a member and hold me accountable if I don't follow through. And, and joining a church is an act of saying, I am now your responsibility and you are my responsibility. And it's, it's kind of countercultural in this individualistic age that we live in. And it's counter to our sinful nature because we don't want to be accountable to anybody. We just want to do what we want to do. So biblical membership means taking responsibility. It, it comes from our mutual obligations that we find in the Bible in those one another passages. Love one another, serve one another, encourage one another, help one another, be kind to one another. All these commands should be encapsulated in the covenant of a healthy church. So it starts with salvation, it involves responsibility, and it assumes attendance unless you're providentially hindered. What does that mean? That means you just can't get here. You're sick, you're traveling, you're homebound, whatever's going on, you have to be somewhere and you just can't be here. But otherwise, every time, at all, if at all possible, you're here. Um, uninvolved, uninvolved members confuse both real members and non-Christians about what it means to be a Christian. Let me say that again. Uninvolved members confuse both real members and non-Christians about what it means to be a Christian. And active members do the voluntarily inactive members no service when they allow them to remain members of the church. Since membership in a local church is the church's corporate endorsement of a person's salvation. Now, maybe I got deep in the weeds on that, but what I'm saying is by calling someone a member of your church, by letting someone become a member of the church, you're saying that that person has your endorsement as a Christian. We believe from what we hear from this person, from what we've seen from this person, from what we know about this person, that this person is following Christ. And so we, we approve, we desire for them to become and be a member of this church. So if a congregation has not set its eyes upon an individual for months or years, how can that church testify that person is faithfully running the race as a Christian? If an individual is missing in action, but has not joined some other Bible-believing church, how do we know if he or she ever really was truly a believer? We don't necessarily know that such uninvolved people are not Christians. We just simply can't affirm that they are. We don't have to tell somebody, we know you're going to hell. We only have to say, we can no longer express our confidence that you are going to heaven because we don't see you, we don't hear from you, we don't know what, what you're doing or anything. So when a person is perpetually absent from church, a church continuing to endorse their membership is at best naive and at worst dishonest. And then biblical membership is meaningful. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to see membership statistics in our church become more and more meaningful so that the members in name become members in fact, not just nominally, but actually. From time to time, this means removing names from the church roles, although not from our hearts. We certainly still care and want the best for them. But we don't love old friends well by allowing them to hold on to their membership in our congregation for sentimental reasons. We love and encourage them 
to join another church where they can love and be loved on a weekly and daily basis. We want them to connect with the church where they will attend, where they will go. And in fact, in many church covenants, you'll find these words. We will, when we move from this place, as soon as possible, unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. This kind of a commitment is part of healthy discipleship, particularly in the age we live in with people moving around all the time. So a recovered practice of careful church membership will have many benefits. It will make the witness of our church to non-Christians clearer. It will make it harder for weaker sheep to stray from the fold and still call themselves sheep. It will shape and focus the discipleship of more mature Christians. It will help church leaders know exactly for whom they are responsible. And in all of this, God will be glorified. So the goal of membership in a local church is that every single church member would help the whole church grow to maturity in Christ. Every member of the church is called to overcome divisions and pursue unity in the church in order to reflect the church's union with Christ. And the members of a local church are interdependent. We all need each other. And no one should say that the church does not need them. And no one can say that they don't need the other members of the church. We all need each other. And so as church members, we have the duty to imitate and submit to our leaders, to regularly assemble with the church, and to love and serve our fellow members. All of these duties are means by which we grow in godliness and we help each other grow. And then another thing about church membership is that the activity that we do of regularly assembling with church members should offer a foretaste of the glory of heaven. You see, the New Testament portrays our present life in the church as a foretaste of the final perfect assembly that we as believers will go to one of these days. Whenever the church local assembles, we experience a preview of the glory of the new heavens and the new earth. Thus, the Bible teaches us not just about the glory of being a Christian, but about the glory of membership in the church because it is in the assembly of the church that we experience the clearest foretaste of these heavenly realities. Our membership in the church is meant to be a pointer to our membership in God's heavenly assembly. So as I bring the message to a close this morning, you need to know that as I serve as the pastor of this church and as I prioritize how to do my ministry, you need to understand that membership has its privileges. You ever heard that? You probably heard it if you have one of these certain credit cards thing. But in, in the case of the church, membership has its privileges as well. Now, while I love everyone, and appreciate all of you, my ministry here is primarily to the members of this church. I've been called by God and the members of Emmanuel Baptist Church to be their pastor. Now, for example, in my family, I love my wife first and foremost, and I love my children. I'm committed to them. They're mine, and I'm theirs. And I would give my life for them, especially for my wife. The Bible says husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now think about what that passage says. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. He did not give himself up for all people without exception. While he is the only savior there is, he's not the savior of all people everywhere. 
He's only the savior of those who put their faith and trust in him. And those are people who are part of the church. God has a particular, unique and special love that his children receive and experience that those who are not his children do not. Now, let me explain it this way. Now, while I love my neighbors and their children, I don't love them like I love my wife and our children. That would be weird. <laughs> that would be wrong. I have a particular, unique, and special love for my family that I don't have for anybody else. And similarly, in pastoral ministry, while I love everyone who attends, my primary, unique, and particular ministry is to the members of this church, to those who have committed to one another, to those who have called me here to be their pastor, to those of us who have covenanted together to carry out the spirit of our covenant and the principles of God's word. And so here's how membership has its privileges. First of all, you get pastoral oversight. You have spiritual care for your soul and your life. Your pastor will help you through trials and difficulties. He will teach you and guide you in the word of God. In fact, um, if you're still in Hebrews, turn over to chapter 13 for just a minute. Hebrews 13, verse 17. Hebrews 13, verse 17. This verse is very interesting. It says, obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief for that would be unprofitable for you. So if you have not covenanted to be a member of this church, then technically I'm not your pastor and I will not have to give an account to God for you. Hebrews 13, 17 says, though, obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Members will receive prioritized care and attention over non-members and will be prioritized in the church's availability for family functions, events, funerals, and weddings. It's just because you're a member. Then there's member oversight. When you join a church, you not only commit yourself to the church, but the church commits itself to you. Brothers and sisters will be there to weep with you when you weep, to rejoice with you when you rejoice, and to walk side by side with you in your Christian life. Why? Because that's the way God designed us. We need each other, and God did not design us to live in isolation. And then there's thirdly ministry opportunities for members. This local church is an arena where you can exercise your spiritual gifts. It's a proving ground of sorts. Um, you can grow and sharpen the gifts that God has given you as you minister to fellow church members and our community neighbors throughout the church. And then members receive the blessings of benevolence. Our church has a benevolence fund that's primarily for blessing its members in a time of true need. We will assist non-members as we're able, but again, members would receive priority. And then I'm, I'm just curious out here among us today, how many of you are members of Costco? Anybody? There's a few of you. Okay. Did y'all have any problem joining Costco? Everything good? They treat you right? Okay, amen. How many of you uh, are members of the library? All right. Can anyone just walk in there and check out a library book? No. You, you gotta have a card, right? You gotta be a member of the library. I'm not saying churches like that exactly. It's not an exact analogy, but I'm just saying that there are places and organizations in life that we'll join and eh, it's no big deal. No, But for some reason, when it comes to church, we're like, nah, I don't know, man. I don't know if I wanna join. Why not? Why don't you want to? If you're not a member of Emmanuel Baptist Church, why not? And maybe you're not sure whether you are a member. 
if you don't know, if you're unsure, come and see me and I'll get you some answers. Maybe, maybe you're not sure whether you can be a member of this church or not. Well, again, come and see me and we can figure that out. I'm just saying, I know that there's some of you here today that aren't members of this church and I don't know why. And I would love to talk with you sometimes, sit down and, and, and discuss this with you. Or maybe today you're like, you know what? I'm ready. I'm ready to join. I'm ready to put my name down and be a part of this fellowship. I've been coming for years. I just never have made it official. I've dated the church for years. Now I'm ready to commit, you know? So if that's something that you're interested in learning more about, come and see me after the service. If you know right now that that's something you wanna do, I've got membership forms right up here on the front pew. I would be glad to hand that to you. And uh, we'll walk you through that process of joining the church. It's not hard. In fact, we don't charge a thing. There's no dues for church membership. The only thing we ask that our members do is Support their church through tithes and offerings as you're able. Commit to love one another, be kind to one another, help one another, encourage one another, pray for one another, and bear one another's burdens. That sounds biblical. And, and then commit to faithfully attend the gatherings of the church, especially the Sunday gathering, unless you're providentially hindered. We're not a club, we're not a clique, we're a local body of baptized believers who are associated by covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing the two ordinances of Christ, committed to his teachings, exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word, and seeking to extend the gospel to the ends of the, of the earth. So come and join us if you have not yet done so and join us in our efforts to serve the Lord and save the world. Amen? Amen? All right, let's pray. Father God, we bow before you. We thank you for your church. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for all you're doing through the ministries of this church. We thank you for all of the hands that are working, serving in so many different ways, all the prayers that are going up, all of the ministry, Lord, we just give you praise. And Lord, we pray that today, first of all, if someone needs to be saved, that today would be the day that they trust in Christ as their Lord and Savior. If they'd never been baptized, that they would follow and be baptized. And if they've never officially joined the church, Lord, today, that they would make that known, that that's something that they want to do and follow the New Testament pattern. And God, we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.